Chapter 11, The Journey North King Fred's spirits rose higher and higher as he rode out of Shoeville and into the countryside. Word of the king's sudden expedition to find the Ichabod had now spread to the farmers who worked the rolling green fields, and they ran with their families to cheer the king and the two lords and the royal guard as they passed. Not having had any lunch, the king decided to stop in Curdsburg to eat a late dinner. We'll rough it here, chaps, like the soldiers we are, he cried to his party as they entered the city famed for its cheese, and was set out again at first light. But of course, there was no question of the king roughing it. Visitors at Curdsburg's finest inn were thrown out onto the street to make way for him. So Fred slept that night in a brass bed with a duck down mattress after a hearty meal of toasted cheese and chocolate fondue. The Lord Spittleworth and Flapoon, on the other hand, were forced to spend the night in a little room over the stables. Both were rather sore after a long day on horseback. You may wonder why that was, if they went hunting five times a week, but the truth was that they generally sneaked off to sit behind a tree after half an hour's hunting, where they ate sandwiches and drank wine until it was time to go back to the palace. Neither was used to spending hours in the saddle, and Spittleworth's bony bottom was already starting to blister. Early the following morning, the king was brought word by Major Beamish that the citizens of Baronstown were very upset the king had chosen to sleep in Kersberg rather than their splendid city. Eager not to dent his popularity, King Fred instructed his party to ride in an enormous circle through the surrounding fields, being cheered by farmers all the way, so they ended up in Baronstown by nightfall. The delicious smell of sizzling sausages greeted the royal party and a delighted crowd carrying torches escorted Fred to the best room in the city. There he was served roasted ox and honey ham and slept in a carved oak bed with a goose down mattress while Spittleworth and Flapoon had to share a tiny attic room usually occupied by two maids. By now, Spittleworth's bottom was extremely painful and he was furious that he'd been forced to ride 40 miles in a circle purely to keep the sausage makers happy. Flapoon, who'd eaten far too much cheese in Curdsburg and had consumed three beefsteaks in Baronstown, was awake all night groaning with indigestion. Next day, the king and his men set off again and this time they headed north soon passing through the vineyards from which eager grape pickers emerged to wave cornucopian flags and receive waves from the jubilant king. Spittleworth was almost crying in pain in spite of the cushion he'd strapped to his bottom and Flapoon's belches and moans could be heard even over the clatter of hooves and jingle of bridles. Upon arrival at Jeroboam that evening they were greeted by trumpets and the entire city singing the national anthem. Fred feasted on sparkling wine and truffles that night before retiring to a silken four-poster bed with a swan's down mattress. But Spittleworth and Flapoon were forced to share a room over the inn's kitchen with a pair of soldiers. Drunken Jeroboam dwellers were reeling about in the street celebrating the presence of the king in their city. Spittleworth spent much of the night sitting in a bucket of ice and Flapoon, who drank far too much red wine, spent the period being sick in a second bucket in the corner. At dawn the next morning, the king and his party set out for the marshlands, after a famous farewell from the city of Jeroboam, who saw him on his way with a thunderous popping of courts that made Spittleworth's horse rear and dish him on the road. Once they dusted Spittleworth off and put the cushion back on his bottom, and Fred had stopped laughing, the party proceeded. Soon they'd left Jeroboam behind and could only hear birdsong. For the first time in their entire journey, the sides of the road were empty. Gradually, the lush green land gave way to thin, dry grass, crooked trees and boulders. Extraordinary place, isn't it? The cheerful king shouted back to Spittleworth and Flapoon. I'm jolly glad to see these marshlands at last, aren't you? The two lords agreed, but once Fred had turned to face the front again, they made rude gestures and mouthed even ruder names at the back of his head. At last, the royal party came across a few people, and how the marshlanders stared. 
they fell to their knees like the shepherd in the throne room and quite forgot to cheer or clap, but gaped as though they'd never seen anything like the king in the royal guard before. Which indeed they hadn't, because while King Fred had visited all the major cities of Cornucopia after his coronation, nobody had thought it worthwhile for him to visit the faraway marshlands. Simple people, yes, but rather touching, aren't they? The king called gaily to his men as some ragged children gasped at the magnificent horses. They'd never seen animals so glossy and well-fed in their lives. And where are we supposed to stay tonight? Lapoon muttered to Sputterworth, eyeing the tumble-down stone cottages. No taverns here. Well, there's one comfort at last, Spittleworth whispered back. He'll have to rough it like the rest of us and see how much he likes it. They rode on through the afternoon and at last the sun began to sink and they caught sight of the marsh where the Ichabok was supposed to live. A wide stretch of darkness studded with strange rock formations. Your Majesty, called Major Beamish, I suggest we set up camp now and explore the marsh in the morning. As your Majesty knows, the marsh can be treacherous. Fogs come down suddenly here. We do best to approach it by daylight. Nonsense, said Fred, who was bouncing up and down in his saddle like an excited schoolboy. We can't stop now when, the, when it's in sight, Beamish. The king had given his orders, so the party rode on until, at last, when the moon had risen and was sliding in and out behind inky clouds, they reached the edge of the marsh. It was the eeriest place any of them had ever seen, wild and empty and desolate. A chilly breeze made the rushes whisper, but otherwise it was dead silent. As you see, sir, said Spittleworth after a while, the ground is very boggy. Sheep and men alike would be sucked under if they wandered out too far. Then the feeble-minded might take these giant rocks and boulders for monsters in the dark. The rustling of these weeds might even take be taken for the hissing of some creature. Yes, true, very true, said Fred, but his eyes still roamed, roamed over the dark marsh as though he expected the Ichabod to pop up from behind a rock. Shall we pitch camp then, sire? asked Lord Flapoon, who'd saved some cold pies from Baronstown and was eager for his supper. We can't expect to find even an imaginary monster in the dark, pointed out Spittleworth. True, true, repeated King Fred regretfully. Let us. Good gracious, how foggy it has become. And sure enough, as they'd been stood looking out across the marsh, a thick white fog had rolled over them so swiftly and silently that none of them had noticed. The King's Lost Sword, Chapter 12 Within seconds, it was as though each of the king's party was wearing a thick white blindfold. The fog was so dense they couldn't see their own hands in front of their faces. The mist smelled of the foul marsh of brackish water and ooze. The soft ground seemed to shift beneath their feet as many of them turned unwisely on the spot. Trying to catch sight of each other, they lost all sense of direction. Each man felt adrift in a blinding white sea, and Major Beamish was one of the few to keep his head. Have a care, he called. The ground is treacherous. Stay still. Don't attempt to move. But King Fred, who was suddenly feeling rather scared, paid no attention. He set off at once in what he thought was the direction of Major Beamish, but within a few steps he felt himself sinking into the icy marsh. Help! he cried as the freezing marsh water flooded over the top of his shining boots. Help! Beamish, where are you? I'm sinking! There was an immediate clamour of panicked voices and jangling armour. The guards all hurried off in every direction, trying to find the king, bumping into each other and slipping over, but the floundering king's voice drowned out every other. I've lost my boots! Why doesn't anybody help me? Where are you all? The Lord Spittleworth and Flapoon were the only two people who followed Beamish's advice and remained quite still in the places they'd occupied when the fog had rolled over them. Spittleworth was clutching a fold of Flapoon's ample platoon, platoon, uh, pantaloons and Flapoon was holding tight to the skirt of Spittleworth's riding coat. 
Neither of them made the smallest attempt to help Fred, but waited, shivering, the calm to be restored. At least if the fall gets swallowed by the bog, we'll be able to go home, Spittleworth muttered to Flapoon. The confusion deepened. Several of the royal guard had now got stuck in the bog as they tried to find the king. The air was full of squelches and clanks and shouts. Major Beamish was bellowing in a vain attempt to restore some kind of order, and the king's voice seemed to be receding into the blind light, becoming ever fainter, as though he was blundering away from them. And then, out of the darkness, came an awful, terror-struck shriek. Beamish! Help! I can see the monster! I'm coming, your majesty, cried Major Beamish. Keep shouting, sir. I'll find you. Help! Help me, Beamish! shouted King Fred. Oh, what's happened to the idiot? Flapoon asked Spittleworth. But before Spittleworth could answer, the fog around the two lords thinned as quickly as it arrived. So they stood together in a little clearing, able to see each other, but still surrounded on all sides by high walls of thick white mist. The voices of the king, of Beamish and of the other soldiers were becoming fainter and fainter. Don't move yet, Spittleworth cautioned Flapoon. Once the fog thins a little bit more, we'll be able to find the horses and we can retreat to a safe. At that precise moment, a slimy black figure burst out of the wall of fog and launched itself at the two lords. Flapoon let out a high-pitched scream and Spittleworth lashed out at the creature, missing only because it flopped to the ground, weeping. It was then that Spittleworth realised the gibbering, panting slime monster was, in fact, King Fred the Fearless. Thank heavens we found you, your majesty. We've been searching everywhere, cried Spittleworth. Ick, 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 whimpered the king. He's got hiccups, said Flapoon. Give him a fright. Ick, ick, ick a bog, moaned Fred. I saw it, a gigantic monster. It nearly caught me. I beg your majesty's pardon, asked Spittleworth. The monster is real, gulped Fred. I'm, I'm lucky to be alive. To the horses, we must flee him quickly. King Fred tried to hoist himself up by climbing Spittleworth's leg, but Spittleworth stepped swiftly aside to avoid getting covered in slime, instead aiming a consoling pat on the top of Fred's head, which was the cleanest part of him. Ah, uh, there, there, your majesty. You've had a most distressing experience falling in the marsh. As we were saying earlier, the boulders do indeed assume monstrous forms in this thick fog. Dash it, Spittleworth! I know what I saw, shouted the king, staggering to his feet unaided. Tall as two horses, it was, and with eyes like huge lamps. I drew my sword, but my hands were so slimy it slipped from my grasp, so there was nothing for it nothing for it but to pull my feet out of my stuck boots and crawl away. Just then, a fourth man made his way into their little clearing in the fog. Captain Roach, father of Roderick, who was Major Beamish's second in command, a big burly man with jet black moustaches. What Captain Roach was really like, we are about to find out. All you need to know is that the king was very glad to see him because he was the largest member of the royal guard. Did you see any sign of the Ichabog roach? whimpered Fred. No, your majesty, he said with a respectful bow. All I've seen is fog and mud. I'm glad to know your majesty is safe at any rate. You gentlemen stay here and I'll round up the troops. Roach made to leave, but King Fred yelped. No, you stay here with me, Roach, in case the monster comes this way. You've still got a rifle, haven't you? Excellent. I lost my sword and my boots, you see. My very best dress sword with the jewelled hilt. Though he felt much safer with Captain Roach beside him, the trembling king was otherwise as cold and scared as he could ever remember being. He also had a nasty feeling that nobody believed he'd really seen the Ichabog. A feeling that increased when he caught sight of Spittleworth rolling his eyes at Flapoon. The king's pride was stung. Spittleworth, Flapoon, he said, I want my sword and my boots back. They're over there somewhere, he added, waving his arm at the encircling fog. Would, would it not be better to wait until the fog's cleared, your majesty? asked Spittleworth nervously. 
I want my sword, snapped King Fred. It was my grandfather's. It's very valuable. Go and find it, both of you. I shall wait here with Captain Roach and don't come back empty handed. Chapter 13. The Accident. The two lords had no choice but to leave the king and Captain Roach in the little clearing in the fog and proceed on to the marsh. Spittleworth took the lead, feeling his way with his feet for the firmest bits of ground. Flapoon followed close behind, still holding tightly to the hem of Spittleworth's coat and sinking deeply with every footstep because he was so heavy. The fog was clammy on their skin and rendered them almost completely blind. In spite of Spittleworth's best efforts, the two lords' boots were soon full up to the brim with fetid water. That blasted nincompoop, muttered Spittleworth, as they squelched along. That blithering buffoon, this is all his fault, the mouse-brained moron. It'll serve him right if that sword is lost for good, said Flapoon, now nearly waist-deep in marsh. We'd better hope it isn't, or we'll be here all night, said Spittleworth. Oh, curse the fog! They struggled onwards. The mist would thin for a few steps, then close again. Boulders loomed suddenly out of nowhere like ghostly elephants, and the rustling reeds sounded just like snakes. Though Spittleworth and Flapoon knew perfectly well that there was no such thing as the Ichabog, their insides didn't quite seem so sure. Let go of me, Spittleworth growled at Flapoon, whose constant tugging was making him think of monstrous claws or jaws fastened on the back of his coat. Flapoon let go, but he too had been infected by an nonsensical fear, so he loosened his blunderbuss from its holster and held it ready. What's that? he whispered to Spittleworth as an odd noise reached them both out of the darkness ahead. Both lords froze the better to listen. A low growling and scrabbling was coming out of the fog. It conjured an awful vision in both men's minds of a monster feasting on the body of one of the royal guards. Who's there? Spittleworth called in a high-pitched voice. Somewhere in the distance, Major Beamish shouted back. Is that you, Lord Spittleworth? Yes, shouted Spittleworth. We can hear something strange, Beamish. Can you? It seemed to the two lords that the odd growling and scrabbling grew louder. Then the fog shifted. A monstrous black silhouette with gleaming white eyes was revealed right in front of them and it emitted, and it emitted a long yowl. With a deafening crashing boom that seemed to shake the marsh, Flapoon let off the blunderbuss. The startled cries of fellow men echoed across the hidden landscape and then, as though Flapoon's shot had frightened it, the fog parted like curtains before the two lords, giving them a clear view of what lay ahead. The moon slid out from behind the cloud that mo at that moment, and they saw a vast granite boulder with a mass of thorny branches at its base. Tangled up in these brambles was a terrified skinny dog whimpering and scam sc scrabbling to free itself, its eyes flashing in the reflected moonlight. A little beyond the boulder, face down in the bog, lay Major Beamish. What's going on? shouted several voices out of the fog. Who fired? Neither Spittleworth nor Flapoon answered. Spittleworth waded as quickly as he could towards Major Beamish. A swift examination was, was enough. The Major was stone dead shot through the heart by Flapoon in the dark. My God, my God, what shall we do? bleated Flapoon, arriving at Spittleworth's side. Quiet, whispered Spittleworth. He was thinking harder and faster than he'd thought in the whole of his crafty, conniving life. His eyes moved slowly from Flapoon and the gun to the shepherd's trap dog, to the king's boots and jewelled sword, which he now noticed half buried in a bog, just a few feet away from the giant boulder. Spittleworth waded through the marsh to pick up the king's swords and used it to slash apart the brambles imprisoning the dog. Then, giving the poor animal a hearty kick, he sent it yelping away into the fog. Listen carefully, whispered Spittleworth, returning to Flapoon, before he could explain his plan, another large figure emerged from the fog, Captain Roach. The king sent me, panted the captain. He's terrified. What ha 
Then Roach saw Major Beamish lying dead on the ground. Spitterworth realised immediately that Roach must be let in on the plan and that, in fact, he'd be very useful. Say nothing, Roach, said Spitterworth, while I tell you what has happened. The Yekobog has killed our brave Major Beamish. In view of this tragic death, we shall need a new Major, and of course this will be you, Roach, for your second in command. I shall recommend a large pay rise for you because you're so valiant. Listen closely, Roach. So very valiant in chasing after the dreadful Ichabog as it ran away into the fog. You see, the Ichabog was devouring the poor Major's body when Lord Flapoon and I came upon it. Frightened by Lord Flapoon's blunderbuss, which he sensibly discharged into the air, the monster dropped Beamish's body and fled. You bravely gave chase, trying to recover the King's sword, which was half buried in the monster's thick hide. But you weren't able to recover it, Roach. So sad for the poor King. I believe the priceless sword was his grandfather's, but I suppose it's now lost in the Ichabog's lair. So saying, Spittleworth pressed the sword into Roach's large hand. The newly promoted major looked down at his jewelled hilt and a cruel and crafty smile to match Spittleworth's own spread over his face. Yes, a great pity that I wasn't able to recover the sword, my lord, he said, sliding it out of sight beneath his tunic. Now, let's wrap up the poor major's body, because it would be dreadful for the other men to see the marks of the monster's fangs upon him. How sensitive you are, Major Roach, said Lord Spittleworth, and the two men swiftly took off their cloaks and wrapped up the body while Flapoon watched, heartily revealed that nobody need know he'd actually kill, killed Beamish. Could you remind me what the Ichabog looked like, Lord Spittleworth? asked Roach, when Major Beamish's body was well hidden for the three of us saw it together and will, of course, have received identical impressions. Very true, said Spittleworth. Well, according to the king, the beast is as tall as two horses, with eyes like lamps. In fact, said Flapoon, pointing, it looks a lot like this large boulder with a dog's eyes gleaming at the base. Tall as two horses, with eyes like lamps, repeated Roach. Very well, my lords. If you'll assist me to put Beamish over my shoulder, I'll carry him to the king and we can explain how the major met his death. Here we are for this part. <laughs>